I'm going to kind of through the top. If there's one thing uh, that you can come away from this talk, uh, it would be to sum this as a scientific proving ground. Um, it is of sufficient size to be meaningful. Um, if we think about how California water works and, and how ecosystem restoration may work, um, but it's small enough to be manageable from a scientific context. It's a, it's a bit of a, a sandbox. And, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But it's also important to recognize that it has a long history of investment, um, not only by the you know the NGOs and, and uh, federal, state, and local agencies, and actually doing acquisitions out there um, and investing in underwriting the research, um, but being able to pinpoint um, that have applications to a much broader area. The research that has been conducted to date and that we continue to conduct has broad implications for the Delta, for the Sacramento Valley, the San Joaquin Valley, and the rest of the Colorado River. And that goes back, you know, predating uh, 1987, so about three decades worth of direct So, you know, it's a, a scientific proving ground that has uh, sufficient size and meaningful, but small enough to manage. A number of studies have come out of it, and all of those are interdisciplinary by design. Many of those are focused on groundwater and hydrology, and some of those results. Certainly the physical processes that underlay uh, process-based restoration, um, aquatic ecology, which remains the focus of much of what we do, and then also some terrestrial ecology. Um, you know, certainly a lot of work on, on birds has been done on the to help frame this uh, perspective, you know, I think it's important to see this and how we approach science uh, endeavors, certainly science in many ways, um, and to separate and to have some period of growth. Hydrological system. 
over a geological time, of course, this river was captured by the American and then subsequently Ptolemy and back and forth during uh, the Pleistocene and the outwash from the glaciers of Sierra Nevada. The sediment builds up and get reorganized and that of course has been changed. That has been a fairly big situation forward, but suffice it to say that in the middle of the valley, which is, is fairly unique in another itself. So the context here is everything. The is providing that natural flow regime, which is where we talk about the magnitude, the timing, the duration of the change um, of these different flows, um, allows us to study the context of how natural flow regime interacts with this riverscape. Um, it's also very unique in that there are a number of existing habitats from uh, you know the foothills all the way down to the, the tidal action of, of the delta that are represented in, in, in fairly uh, large tracks and fairly functional systems. These have been come together, of course, through uh, actions by federal, state, and local agencies to acquisition as well as conservation equipment um, obtained and held by the Nature Conservancy and others to stitch together um, you know, some of the last remnants within this region. It's not to say that there hasn't been some induced change. I should mention that. But Going from from the place of being developed and ultimately now Anthropocene, but the the features on this riverscape have changed dramatically. They've certainly been simplified, um, but the land use changes up in the total amount of habitat throughout this region has also dramatically changed. And as I mentioned, the Cosumnes River has some of the last intact pieces of these habitats, which are conveniently um, adjacent to each other in a sense that we can look at a mosaic. Of different habitat types um, along the same room that are hydrologically connected. It's very different today than it was in the past, and there's been a lot of work by San Francisco Estuary Institute, Nelson Whipple, a student of mine at UC Davis, and others to try to recreate the past of the Delta. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this report, but I think it was you know foundational for me to, to see the evidence for what was, and I think it's very different than perhaps this idea of gallery forests from end to end is that there was actually a lot of standing water. Um, and I think by the end, that's where I would like to get back to. So the hydro modification on this riverscape, of course, includes the channelization and levee building, uh, the dams on many of these other rivers, uh, version. I would also include in this sort of the groundwater diversion, many are acutely aware of now. Um, and these have had tremendous implications to the floodwaters in the natural flow regime of the, the rivers in the valley in particular. Uh, but when we talk about that flow regime, we're talking about the magnitude, timing, duration, frequency, and connectivity um, going forward. So we're in this, this period of, of growth and thinking about how uh, riverine ecosystems can be restored. Um, so during you know the early days, 30 years ago, and seeing these ex habitats that were available, whether they were riparian forests, you know, tidal wetlands, et cetera, that there was this idea that we could begin to restore some of the intervening properties in such a way as to create this continuum. That led to a, a paradigm of horticultural restoration in which we were spending a lot of time and effort, um, you know, planting saplings and, and acorns and, and trying to jumpstart uh, late seral stage forests and so forth. And so we were looking across that continuum of succession and riparian systems and, and trying to intervene in a fairly meaningful way, I would suggest that this is kind of a, a linear approach to trying to achieve some ecosystem restoration objectives, such as maximizing biomass over time. Um, and the histogram that you see shows the number of acres that were stored, restored in the Cosumnes River Preserve over a period of time. And you can see that there was this initial period of growth and then perhaps it began to taper off in some way in part because a lot of these restoration efforts didn't fulfill their, their full objective in, in creating ecosystem processes, right? There were a number of trees out there. They did provide some habitat for birds and others in terms of things like nutrient cycling and reproduction and um, other facets of a functioning ecosystem they happen uh, to be missing. And in part, it wasn't just riparian restoration that was happening in California and the Delta in particular, but uh, throughout the United States, we were spending a lot of money, you know, and since this is, you know, 
over a billion dollars a year in restoration, um, but had no form of assessment or monitoring of those projects. We had no real sense of where they were going. Um, and many of these projects were not designed to actually evaluate the consequences of these restoration actions, right? So it wasn't until we started to investigate this that we saw that horticultural restoration often alone was insufficient to meet all of those objectives. Additional uh, synthesis began to you know, indicate that restoration as a science in particular needed to be heavily embedded with policy. And I think we can recognize now that you can't have one without the other, that embedded in this as well as uh, uncertainties in the science and that we had to, to learn to accommodate that. And, and certainly the outgrowth of adaptive management um, was one of the consequences from that observation. We needed the general framework of the and most of all, we needed monitoring. Um, and it had to be not only the correct scale of measurement in those cases of time, but it needed to be continued. And I think that's one of the observations that I've been able to make for my work at the summit is that without the monitor, we wouldn't be able to say anything about anything. So during this period of equilibrium then, um, you know, a number of things began to happen. The growth of ecosystem restoration science certainly progressed and, and a number of other of Scientists and other systems began to recognize that subsystem connectivity in particular um, drove ecosystem processes. And it was those insights coupled with some on the ground uh, observations that kind of led to a, a new paradigm. And so Ward and Tochner here suggest that restoration should focus on reestablishing diverse river functions, including processes of ecological succession, hydrologic connectivity, and the interface between aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. Much of our thinking then at the consumption is really based on an accident. And that accident happened to be a levee failure, right? So that, um, you know, the, it's no surprise that a levee failed, but it was the outgrowth of that levee failure that led to a change and a shift in the paradigm and thinking about ecosystem restoration. Um, in this case, it's indicated in 1985 that this levee breach happened. Um, based on my own analysis and, and some discussion with others, um, we think that it was probably the 1986 water year that, that led to this particular breach. It turns out 1985 was um, unremarkable in many respects. It, so it's not impossible for that to happen, but more likely that the high waters of 86 led to this levee breach. A sand spray was created. Um, the farmer that was growing tomatoes at that particular time wasn't able to prepare the levee and or plow the field, and what grew out of that was an accidental forest. Um, ten years later, there were a number of engineering levy breaches that led to some of these insights. So that accidental forest then um, was, you know, that was the paradigm shift. It was that, wow, we could actually let rivers do the work. We could let rivers bring in the substrate and the nutrients and the water and the germinant in order to establish something that we've been working so hard from a horticultural perspective. And so we know a number of things come in with these floodwaters, right? Those sediments, the nutrients, the water. Um, and then these propagules, sometimes pumpkins, um, other times fishes. Um, but we didn't understand enough about the, the properties of these floodwaters um, in both space and time in order to say anything insightful about that. Um, but starting with uh, the engineered levee breaches in 1985 in a place we referred to as the Triangle Floodplain, we were able to piece together a number of different insights and to provide some synthesis as to what process-based restoration can. One of those studies um, had to do with primary productivity. Um, Dylan Ahern, as he was completing his doctorate, um, was able to, to conduct a number of in situ uh, samples and relate that back to the hydrograph, which is in the upper left. And you can see that at uh, chlorophyll, once it's connected, the high chlorophyll water is pushed towards the exit. Low chlorophyll water is on the entry. Um, that there are these manifestations over space and time that have consequences um, for primary productivity, secondary productivity, issues, um, chemical constituents such as salt and otherwise. Um, based on the insight from water quality, so it's the primary productivity, and then ultimately. Uh, to, to zooplankton and so forth, we were able to stitch together the amount of time necessary to achieve these objectives to maximize uh, productive growth over time as a function of the natural flow rate. So exceeding that threshold, floodwater is going on to the 
floodplain um, in the amount of you know, uh, the amount of time, so the resonance time, the water, the magnitude of those floods, the frequency of those floods, and so forth. And then piece that together as well with what uh, Chinook salmon were doing. And so uh, this is the, the photo that's been seen a million times, um, but it's certainly worth emphasizing that uh, Carson Jeffries' master piece is very simple and elegant in design. It was very instrumental in thinking about how juvenile salmon benefit from floodplain. Um, not only is there higher survivorship, you know, by the number that more, more fish on the right than on the left, but they're obviously bigger, right? And other science has gone on to show us that uh, the largest size of the individual out migration, the greatest likelihood of surviving oceanic conditions, the greater likelihood of returning. Uh, so, fluidity, uh, you know, these salmon a jump start on life, and nursery is too well instrumental to their, their long term. The invertebrate productivity flows that drive a lot of that are infinitely tied uh, to the flow regime itself. So these multiple pulse flows that happen from mid-February to late June in a, in a wet year, um, the duration of that floodplain, the residence time on there, um, the rate of draining, et cetera, um, has proved you know, instrumental to the, con the connection between salmon growth and uh, primary productivity. But we know that not all years are equal, and we know that those um, sediments um, that uh, are either scoured away or deposited on the floodplain only happen in rare years. And we know that floodplain connectivity in itself some, in some years doesn't happen, as shown here in 2001, and certainly a lot of the work we've done with this past year, I think the total events that we have to is the, it's the long nature of these data that allow us to say with some confidence as to what the probability would be of achieving a particular outcome. Mm -hmm. That reorganization of thought then, physical processes being driven by the hydrology, yep. um, could be combined uh, in a way to do which the process of integration into the number of acres that underwent phosphate restoration to become this river preserve, you could see that, you know, by the late 1990s that there was a real push then um, to replace active and or horticultural restoration with process-based restoration. Um, and one way of framing that is that rather than looking at maximizing an ecosystem endpoint such as biomass, is that we could begin to look at an ecosystem process and how that changes over time. Um, so whether that's habitat uh, creation, um, perhaps you know, creating canopy gaps in Lake Charles State Forest, having rivers be able to do what rivers do. Um, Thank you. So just a snapshot of uh, what that lower sub-Triangle looked like in, in, uh, shortly after the breaches. And so we're fortunately in 1995, right before the 96-97 uh, high water year. Um, so this photo, I think, was in, in 1998. Um, you can see the accidental forest patch there, kind of um, dead center. And you can see that one of these breaches is here, the sand splay that's created, uh, cottonwood and willow forest starting to grow along its margin. Uh, this photo is a little bit dark, um, but suffice it to say that that uh, intentional forest, as they call it now, has grown quite rapidly. Um, based on some of our uh, LIDAR work, previously we were estimating uh, the growth rate of cottonwood in this area at a meter per year in vertical growth. Um, based on some other studies not shown here, we've been able to, to, to show that the growth rate in total biomass um, between horticultural restoration and process-based restoration is, is significantly different, and, and certainly the process restoration uh, grows uh, faster and, and puts on more biomass. Um, and adjusted for vegetation types. Um, this is all well and good, but there remains a problem in ecosystem restoration in this case, and that is that the Cosumnes River um, is bone dry a good portion of the year. So achieving these benefits is limited to a very uh, small portion of the year, and some of our other work, because it is interdisciplinary by design, has shown that uh, groundwater withdrawals drive um, much of this disconnection. You know, Remember that I said that the Cosumnes has a low water yield, doesn't have much snowpack, there really wasn't much water in this system. Historically, 
terms of the, the fluvial portion of it, but um, this having run bone dry is uh, indicative of a much larger systemic problem. And that has to do with the grandfather withdrawal, the bone compression, the one who is the south road, the other one can salt, which reduces the space and flows on the point of connection, and the loss of what we might call natural capital, right? So when there's uh, an early fall rain, so much of the water is being used for saturation in order to saturate the riverbed, so much of it's lost and it's unavailable for the water. So looking at this framework of, of how um, floodplains work and, and primary productivity relates to secondary production and the emergence of, of invertebrates and ultimately providing food to, to birds, bats, and, and fishes, um, is that we recognize that there was a, a missing component to the hydrologic regime. Um, and ultimately, that was groundwater. So when it came time to reorganize our thinking, to, to bust out of this equilibrium, the dissolution of our dominant paradigm when it comes to thinking about process-based restoration, if we just let the floodwaters come, we'll solve everything. Well, in this case, with the groundwater depletion um, so great, that in and of itself wasn't enough. And so the next round of restoration then required us to begin thinking about groundwater. And so with some, uh, in coordination with uh, the Nature Conservancy and the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, we proposed a, a before after control impact type experimental design um, to be able to look at the localized benefit from uh, floodplain restoration with a specific focus on, on localized groundwater recharge, but also including hydrocorse reversals, riparian vegetation, and a number of other components. So thematically beginning to thinking about this is that because the consumption of river is heavily size and uh, heavily modified by these levees and by groundwater withdrawal, um, Putting all these components together in, in order to achieve um, a riparian forest adjacent to uh, floodplains required us to think about all of those different components. Um, and ultimately, if we had an ecosystem objective of, of providing more habitat for birds, for example, we had to think about soil carbon. We had to think about the local aquifer. We had to think about those floodwaters um, and how often uh, they would connect to the adjacent uh, flood. And so this most recent uh, set of studies is now in the monitoring phase. Um, I hope that I'll be able to report back on the success of our application for uh, permits in order to flood the floodplain. Um, but the, the design of this zone, which is just upstream from the triangle floodplain that we looked at previously on this uh, property north of Twin Cities Road, um, ultimately would include about 800 acres of adjacent uh, floodplain. Uh, and so understanding the implications for the natural flood regime, the natural flow regime onto the floodplain and being able to recharge uh, local aquifers, being able to provide uh, habitat for juvenile salmon, being able uh, to provide uh, the nutrients and sediments necessary to promote uh, riparian forests um, became the new focus. What's unique about this particular study, however, is that rather than just being horticultural or process-based restoration, this particular study actually combines the two of those. And so, you know, almost a thousand acres then would undergo some type of treatment for their, you know, the horticultural planting of, of different appropriate species, um, or it would be a control, uh, remnant forests or old fields in that floodplain. Um, or some combination of the two. And so we're almost three years into the kind of pre-implementation monitoring for a baseline study. And uh, with some uh, luck in, in permitting, we'll be able to initiate the excavation at the end of the summer. And, um, you know, it's 50-50 odds that an El Nino wet year is going to happen this year, the flood of the century. And we'll be able to look at these stacked ecosystem services over time. So localized recharge, fish growth, carbon storage, et cetera. 
So to get back to that initial premise of the cosmonauts being a scientific proving ground, a lot of these ideas on things like setback levees and what the benefits are, whether it's floodplain storage, groundwater recharge, conjunctive use, et cetera, comes from that sandbox of us being able to actually look at a place that's small enough um, to, to be manageable from a scientific perspective, but large enough to be me meaningful when applied to larger areas. So we're kind of at that period then of, of reorganizing our thoughts, um, in part because of the information now being provided uh, by SFEI and the report by Allison and, and others, is that what we thought the Cosumnus was, you know, a, a river like many others uh, coming off the west slope of the Sierra Nevada, was actually a little bit different. A lot of the historical evidence suggests that it was sink of the Cosumnus. And so all of that area in blue shown on this map from the 1850s was in fact standing water. So if you remember, I showed that photo of the river channel today, which is going dry. In many cases, it is a long period of time. Is it was that standing water that was present, in part because of those lateral domains, the lateral um, natural vessels of the Sacramento River, uh, creating a pinch point for Snodgrass Slough and the McCullough River and the Columbus River all came together. Um, but there was sufficient water in the system and elevated water tables to create perennial standing water throughout the system. I think that has some profound implications if we begin to think about the restoration of this particular property outlined in red, that what was observed was a heterogeneous picture of tule marshes, willow thickets, and riparian forests. And small tributary channels, rather than a single incised channel, which we have today, um, it was flooded annually for weeks and months. We have to really be thinking about what our objectives are for the system restoration perspective. Um, and then perhaps we may be for something a little bit different today than we had in the past. But that fits somewhat neatly with a lot of what's been proposed for the Delta Pole in the realm of reconciliation. So, what are we trying to achieve? The map on the left hand side shows what um, the pre existing vegetation would have been. Um, around 1850. On the right-hand side, it shows what it is today. Whether we could ever get back to the, the left-hand side I, is, is a bit in question. However, I do think we can get back to the hydrological principles and the process um, of in, in looking at physical processes as a basis for this. Um, there are a number of pre-existing channels running through that property today. Um, but it just may be that that gradient, that mosaic that I said that was connected hydrologically, is going to be much more compressed. Um, so rather than being a continuum you know, from foothill woodland vegetation down to the tidal, uh, tidally influenced vegetation, is that we may have some components of that, um, but if so, they're going to be compressed over space. The implication for that, however, is pretty profound. If we were to look at the amount of inundated areas, function of flow, and accessing the floodplain, is that today, um, it takes a much higher flow to actually access these floodplains due to the institute that has some implications for the amount of actual restoration that can happen. If we were to couple that spatial approach, what uh, Allison is referring to hydrospatial, and couple that with the life history requirements of species of interest, we could begin to define the space and time of where particular species might be and to, to maximize the, the flow objective meeting um, that particular uh, species if we wanted to, to manage for that in a, in a managed ecosystem. So the insights from the this can be applied elsewhere. Of course, we would be able to provide graphs like this about the life history requirements of a particular species if we weren't actually doing the monitoring. So the monitoring that we continue to do with this is instrumental in part because, you know, we get this thin clip steelhead out of my colony that happened to swim the wrong way up the river. Um, but we were also able to show that, you know, sturgeon in this case are accessing the floodplain as well, as may be the, the first documented case of that. So if you don't go out and look, you'll never know. The other thing that we've been able to show with our monitoring is that uh, native fishes actually have some inherent cue to move off of the floodplain. There's been some uh, consternation about stranding of native fishes on floodplains during process-based restoration. Our most recent monitoring work has been able to show um, as a function on this graph, the dark red pie being the percent of native fish exiting the floodplain, that during that snowmelt recession period, as it nears disconnection, uh, all of 
the native fish have in fact exited the swim plate, and after the connection, the only fishes remaining are non-native. So if we manage the flow regime in such a way as to, to meet the magnitude, timing, duration, rate of change in this case, um, we can also manage for this. I probably couldn't get through this talk without talking about the grout. Um, and so in this case, you know, this is where information becomes critical. Uh, this snapshot was uh, in February from when the floodwaters actually went down the channel. Um, and we're standing down here. The floodwater is moving very slowly, as it turns out. Uh, we're making their way down the Oneto Denier restoration site. Um, but this is where hydrological monitoring um, becomes important. The Cosumnes is also unique because it's one of the few gauges in California that has over 100 years of data and daily flows. And based on that, we can calculate things like the return interval of a given drought. It turns out this is about a 1 in 30 drought. And you really have to look at uh, the 76-77 drought if you want to see something totally exceptional when there was almost 600 straight days of a, a dry riverbed. Information becomes key, um, and monitoring in this case is critical. It's based on that hydrological data that we were able to uh, propose not a water year typing method, but a flood year typing method. Um, Eric Booth, part of his master's thesis, was able to combine the daily flows peak magnitude and flood duration shows that there were these different types of flood years um, and that had these different types of hydrographs and different frequencies for return intervals and so forth and to be able to type these out to show that you know some years are dry and others are wet and there are many in between. Um, but I think it's you know important to show that any given year you're gonna get something different. So the exceptional year that we're having this year will be followed by another year which is exceptional in and of itself. Obviously, we've had this trend of dry years here, labeled as one. But again, without the numbness as the scientific proving ground for this, we wouldn't do it. I'd like to close um, by suggesting that as the scientific proving ground, we can draw insight uh, to think about managed ecosystems and managed flow. And the paper that is supposed to go in today, Chris, uh, uh, led by Sari now and others is that can we uh, look to functional flows? So combining physical processes and life history requirements of species of concern, can we actually propose flows that are going to meet those um, needs yet at the same time incorporate uh, human needs as well? And so in the process, can we enhance aquatic biodiversity alongside these human needs to make adjustments uh, for non-stationary environments, um, in part, you know, it's seen a signal for climate change, hydrochromatic alteration, and so forth. Um, can we use a framework to, to, to step forward? So the natural flow regime, in terms of low flows, being able to, to look at fine sediment deposition or transition flows to recession limb uh, to meet, you know, amphibian reproduction needs, keep back into reorganizing flood plains creating disturbance and so forth. How do we build that into a managed river? I think that's the challenge that we all face and certainly one that most of you are very acutely aware of. I would just go to say that, you know, Cosumnus has provided a lot of insights as to how we might be able to do that. Um, and those are now being stitched together um, throughout the, the North Delta. So as we think of this as a series of puzzles, we might look at the Cosumnus uh, as that foundational piece of the restoration science hub and the work that Don Grant and Pierre Moyle and others are doing in the North Delta and the Nags Ranch uh, project, the Nigiri project that's been growing down and out on, on rice fields, all of this together to provide a more holistic view of what our reconciled With that, I'd like to say thank you.
you talked about uh, native fish leaving the flood plains. Do you know, I know besides salmon and split tail, where do they go? Do, are there refugia near the, those, those areas that they go the year? That's a great question. And in fact, one component of the study that is yet to be implemented in parks, we're not quite there yet, um, is using uh, pit tags to actually identify individual fishes. And, and we've, we've been placing pit tags in fishes that are caught in these uh, pike nets that have been providing some baseline uh, information. Most of those have been, you know, been focused on larger potted native fishes. Um, we don't have an array in the lower uh, Cosumnus and, and its confluence with the um, So we can't really say about where they go, but we have caught fish up river at the Costello property, which is above 99. Um, so some of them are certainly migrating upstream. Um, I think what confounds that is that it, because the river does go dry over such a large stretch. Um, they're either you know, moving up really high, which may be doubtful, though you know, it's been documented that red bass, red-eye bass, in fact, had moved up quite high. Um, and presumably came out of the delta. Uh, or they move you know, downriver. Um, but in terms of on the preserve itself, that can count in fact as a good drive. We don't have any direct observation. However, we have started to re-catch certain individuals over the past couple of years. I guess the short answer is no. I have no idea where they're going. But we're trying. <laughs> Do you know what percentage of water is diverted out of the watershed through the groundwater pumping? Do you know? Yeah, that's a great question, and I would defer uh, to my colleagues, uh, Graham Fogg at UC Davis and Maurice Hall at Nature Conservancy. So it's significant. Um, some of the more recent studies have been. Graham Fogg and, and his students have developed both a, a local and a regional uh, groundwater model, um, and then some subsequent studies in collaboration with TNC to look at the amount of water that would need to, to be recharged from an injection or etc. To help uh, bring back the water to the table so that there would be less of that request. Uh, there was one. Uh, early study that was done um, with releases from the whole house now uh, to pre-wet the channel. That was a one-off, and since then, um, we haven't seen as much traction to do the same, though I think it remains a, a very good idea. There's some probably simple question. I'm just curious where the river goes dry, because you know you have the tidal influence, and I've just never I've been up there, but I'm just curious where it actually sort of becomes dry, so to speak. Right. Um, maybe if I go to the map. And, and part of this is based on my answer on personal observation, but um, there are some properties that can't be accessed. Um, just as kind of a point of reference, if you're familiar with the McCormick Williamson uh, track being down here, uh, high five. Um, as you head up to the preserve, and, and we talked about that triangle floodplain. Adjacent to the lower and triangle floodplain, there's usually uh, standing water for a good portion of it, so it's lower floodplain. It does go dry. There's small ponds. I've uh, seen raccoons by the by the tins, you know, feasting on these uh, small isolated ponds. And then um, it goes dry, I think, all the way up to, to 16, uh, which is pretty far off. Um, and the, the regional groundwater models actually suggest that the, um, in the riverbed itself, that the depth to groundwater is most pronounced um, up near Highway 16, and so in these, these far upper reaches. Obviously, as you get closer to the tidal influence, the, the hydrostatic pressure is going to meet right there, and so you'll have a, a feeling of that. So it gets shallow. 
Josh, uh, uh, there was some discussion before I left about the, the wastewater application or tertiary water application. Is that anything progressed on that? Um, so Eric is referring to a TNC um, inspired idea. And if there's someone that would like to <laughs> comment on that, I'd be happy to do. No, that was... Rod, do you know anything about that? Is that is that is that a, a bad can of worms for me to open? I don't have any detail to add to that other than that it, it's still an idea that's being explored. Basically, we're working with Sac Sanitation District to do more of that pre-wetting uh, exercise that Josh referred to that showed promise. Um, so stay tuned. I brought that up because last week we had a, a speaker that was here talking about stormwater capture and is thinking that it's kind of a you know, a similar story, different different version. Yeah, Josh, you mentioned that you're going to be trying to move some earth, I thought you said, towards the end of the summer here. Um, I just wanted to know what, um, you know, obviously this area provides a lot of habitat for not only juvenile fishes but avian life as well. Um, how are you approaching or have you approached designing some of these floodplains for various species? Yeah, in terms of grading options. Um, I see uh, Dr. Chief Gross in the audience who's the lead on this particular project. Perhaps he would like to address that. Uh, yeah, I just, I guess I would add about that that, um, you know, I think we're recognizing that some birds use early successional riparian forest that isn't well represented in some of the horticultural plantings that were done previously. So the idea here is to represent things like willows and cottonwoods more in the plant activity. We expect those to represent disproportionately high in the natural recruits as well. Hi, Josh. Can you make a couple comments about the vegetation that's uh, forming in both your accidental and, you know, intentional forest? I mean, in terms of overstory and, and also an understory, what kind of diversity are you seeing? Um, and how many species? And, you know, I'm especially interested in what's coming in for the understory, uh, just because of the potential for so many weeds to recruit onto the side through through flows. Yeah, that's a great question, Drew. Um, I, myself, have not done any of that sampling in at least I think 10 years at this point. So I'd probably, uh, I know that TNC has an active uh, monitoring program in those particular areas. I've been focused more on structural components, and structural diversity, and promote the things. Of those things. Um, one of the ERP-funded projects uh, that I did not go into uh, was a lithidium latifolium control uh, experiment in many ways, and in part because the, the idea was that a lot of propagules, not just pumpkins, uh, come onto the floodplain, and many of those are non-native in, in origin. And so there was some fear, um, based on some early uh, infestations of lepidium on the floodplain, that you know what we've created was a giant weed patch. Um, after, you know, uh, I think we're seven years out now from this particular study, which looked at a combination of uh, two different pesticides and solarization through tarping. Um, and looking at you know, population dynamics and, and patch establishment uh, dynamics, is that there is a hydrological component to it. Um, you know, this wet year, dry year dynamic actually proves to be pretty important. Um, and a dry year following a wet year seems to, to promote a, a large profusion of lipidium in particular. Uh, we were able to show that you know, uh, pest disease uh, herbicides, in fact, are, are quite effective at what they do, and, and, but you need 100% effect. Um, because of the over, you know, I think it's a billion seeds per square meter with the pigeon. And that they also do protect the bug camp. So having, you know, using solely an herbicide approach, particularly in these sorts of lands, indoor adjacent to some cases organic rice production, of course, you have to be acutely aware of the population status and its presence. Um, but you also need to manage with. Uh, the hydrologic regime. Um, so, as it turns out, you know, flooding can be a good thing, though it can create disturbance and dislodge these. Um, we, you know, but a, a dry year also allows them, them to take off. But the dry year would be the time when you'd want to go in a um, 
I think what we found from that is that the, the population actually stabilized at, at a certain point. That there was exponential growth for swell on in a coast that should be put um, out in nature. It, it isn't always the case. Um, and so from that, you know, I think we felt like it, you know, at the end of the day, which was going to take over. And in many cases, even though we've found lithium patches in, you know, with a lot of overstory, um, and well established by Grand Forest is that it, its growth is, is pretty limited and so forth. So with this ecological succession, you know, the hope would be that everything else will be over and that uh, continued maintenance uh, would be important. Um, Judah, do you want to chime in? Why well, I had a different question. I didn't oh, mean okay. Um, yeah, I would, you know, I'm happy to refer you to some of those Clopidium studies. Um, but we do, our hydrochlorate team has been doing some sampling um, of the seed bank. Um, and I do, I think I deleted the slides, but it, it's fairly um, interesting in that about half of the seeds coming in onto the floodplain are native to origin, which I think we thought it was going to be disproportionately low. Um, so that holds a lot of promise um, in many ways. And I think for something like the pitium in particular, we were able to trace, you know, source population of the stream. And it becomes an interesting problem for uh, reserve managers is that if you really want to get a cap, on this invasion process, you might have to actually venture outside of your actual reserve, um, which you know has some implications. But particularly in this fluvial system where you have to work the stream, you'll be spending countless hours plus money trying to combat something that is never going to go away until you take care of that source. Yeah, um, I just I appreciated how much your talk underscored the importance of monitoring, not only just monitoring, but a long-term monitoring program um, where you get the most and, and observe things that you wouldn't be able to notice otherwise. Um, and I'm just curious, I, I know logistically it's got to be a nightmare trying to organize long-term monitoring programs around a system. And early on in the slides, you, you showed a figure of dollars being spent on riparian restoration and then you know, not so much on monitoring. And I just wondered if that trend is continuing or if people are starting to invest more in monitoring and long-term monitoring around riparian I bet there are at least 20 people in this room um, that can say whether they're putting more money into monitoring. Uh, you know, I think we will continue to propose it. I think realistically the, you know, three decades of, of work out of this, as you know, wouldn't have been possible without several different entities um, investing time and money with some larger objectives. So it isn't just, you know, at the university level us, you know, trying to do the science and working on, you know, three to five year grants in order to do that, but you know, recognizing that part of the larger objective is collecting the information in such a way that we can inform um, other places. And you know, over time that that begins to develop some inertia to it. It's not to say that everything's continuous. You know, we did some uh, some bat studies out of you know UC Berkeley was out there um, using um, acoustics to, to be able to do that, and those were a couple you know just a couple years or something like that. It's informative, um, but as you say, without the kind of continuous monitoring in place, it's difficult to pick up these trends um, and and things that may be episodic in nature, which I think we've been fortunate enough, particularly in like aquatic side of things and, and bird, you know, the Point Blue should you know, certainly be uh, pointed out as, as being an active partner in all of this and, and their long term studies is certainly proven as Hi. Um, you gave us some description of the accidental forest and the intentional forest. There is the old forest too. Yeah. Which has a really different structure. The, yeah, the, so what there well there are a couple of different old forests. Do you wanna Clarify on that. I have a whole different talk about riparian structure that I could uh, go into, but well, having just walked around in the site once, it's the one where there's no blackberry, no exotic species, or sedges underneath. It's essentially valley oak and sedges and carrots underneath. Yeah, so there is a site that we refer to as uh, the tall forest. I know that, uh, some of the reserve managers have a different name for it. Um, yeah, and it was the focus of uh, some some dendrochronology work that was done. And in fact, it isn't quite as old as I thought it was. It, you know, some of those trees are on the order of you know, 100 years old, not you know, several hundred years old for Valley Oak, which you know, is you know, certainly large in structure. Um, I have seen some native California blackberry out there, but as you know, this is typically hard anyway. 
Um, there's native graves that they did. They did the, the hydraulics in that particular site, if we're talking about the same one, uh, it's a little bit different. And there's a lot of influence, but, but there is some tidal influence. It seems to be perennially wet. And perhaps that's kind of where I'm getting to. So the, the nature of the larger mosaic of things to be very, very different. And perhaps it's being perpetuated uh, because of its spatial position and context. I, you know, I could refer you to some other stuff about this. Comparing that specific site in terms of diversity to the accidental forest, because we've run those, some of those numbers on composition of diversity indices and turnover and things like that. Anyone else? Well, that was great, Josh. Thank you. Thank you all. And just a reminder, the, the next talk, the last talk in this series nominally, will be the 28th in this room with Robin Grossinger here to talk about the Delta Landscapes Project. So keep a lookout for that. Thanks.